There he <laughs> there is. There it is. All right, perfect. The podcast perfect. just got better. <laughs> nice, dude. So where are you guys located right now? Uh, but I'm in uh, London and... Um, Craig has just woken up. It's like Oz. 5 a.m. in Australia. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> All right. Good times. We're super stoked to chat to you, man. Thanks yeah, for man. making yeah. the time. Me too, man. Let me just um, send one last message here, and mm. then I'm going to turn my phone off. Uh, how's it going? Yeah, good. And yeah, yourself? Awesome. Great, man. Doing really well. I just I got this new dog here that I'm... Uh, oh, cool. Foster, it's called Foster to Adopt, so I'm... I just picked her up yesterday, and last night was our first night, so I'm going to take care of her for a couple of weeks and see if it's a fit to stick. And so she's oh, cool. she's here by my side. I'm not used to having a dog. I've never had a dog, so. Oh, that's oh, so awesome. cool, but I can't wait to get a dog. I swear it's like the – it's just like one of the first things like on my list. My girlfriend and I want to move later on this year, and I just can't wait to get a dog. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I had one with my ex-girlfriend, but I've never tried to have one on my own, and it's just – it's been calling me the idea of it lately, so I finally just pulled the trigger. So Let's I've done a it a few up. times now. <laughs> uh, I think uh, about 150 times so far. No, actually, fuck, that's not true because I've been a guest on 30 yeah, something um, shows. So wow. yeah, I'm probably up to maybe 200 recordings or something at this wow. point. Wow, yeah. crazy! Man. Yeah, it's, man. it's amazing. Eh? Wow. It's fun. I dig your yeah. setup there. It looks really cool where you're sitting. It just looks. Get the sound it's not, Yeah, it's really. This yeah, is my just, uh, this is my man cave. Yeah, I've got my clear light infrared sauna here, and then I just put a little sweet. baffle on there, you know, just to get the yeah. sound a little more muffled. But luckily, this this room is it's like the second bedroom in my flat, and uh, I made it into an office, and it's carpeted, probably oh, it's... for the benefit of whoever's living downstairs. So it's actually <laughs> a pretty it's a decent sounding room. So this is where I record all of my intros and outros and promos and things like that, you know, for for my own podcast. So yeah, it's cool. It's comfortable in here. That's Especially cool. now with the little dog next to me. <laughs> I keep it's I'm like, like a, afraid I'm gonna step on her so I'm like, oh shit, I gotta remember there's a dog in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool stuff. Good stuff. There we go. That's funny. Now you guys are reversed left yeah. and right. <laughs> uh, okay, so my all my things are now recording. Buddy, just briefly to... there briefly, Luke, yeah. I, I just saw you interviewed Donny Epstein, who's a chiropractor. I did. Um, and uh, he must have been probably an interesting bloke, hey? He was, um, he was very interesting. And um, I was just listening back to it yesterday. And yeah. about 50% of the time, I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> He's yeah. like, you really have to really stay present and have an open mind to really grasp what he was talking about. And I was listening to that. I listened to about half of it yesterday on a drive. And I'm like, yeah, I need to listen to this a few times to really take it in. Because <laughs> during the he conversation. He's out there, eh? During the conversation, I'm, you know, I'm managing the recording and yeah. wanting to steer the conversation a certain way. So yeah. I'm, I'm listening, but listening from a different point of view yes. than just as an arbitrary podcast listener, you know. So I, yes, yes. There's a lot to learn from him. It was a really interesting experience. Oh. Yeah, he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, yeah I was yeah, really fortunate to be able to have that opportunity. It just fell together in a really sudden random way and i was like oh cool i'm doing this now this is awesome oh, cool yeah sure cool, man cool All right, thanks guys. again yeah thanks so much man i appreciate you having me on and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna run out of the house now but i'll i'll have this file on my hard drive so if you need it just let me know and i'll put it in dropbox for you thanks. see you later have man. a good day you day too, or buddy. night whatever it is where you are thanks, <laughs> cheers bud. cheers guys bye bye, bye. 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 <laughs> I laugh but yes yeah, so what a cool flipping cool oak there man yes yeah yeah i must say he's a really nice guy as well isn't he yes yeah, but and, and good uh, afternoon there, Mr. Luke Story from LA. How are you doing, my man? Thank you so much. What's for... happening? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's an uncharacteristically gray and gloomy day here in Los Angeles, so <laughs> I don't feel like I'm really representing my city in the way that I should be. <laughs> Usually, right now, I'd be looking outside. It'd be 80 degrees and bright <laughs> sunny, no matter what time of year it is. But yeah, today it's it's a little it's funny here. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. I feel like I'm in London or something today. Oh, bad well, yeah, I used to this <laughs> today. <laughs> for the first time in a long time we had a beautiful day so it's a, it's a nice surprise when you get sun in london that's for sure awesome man. yeah and i saw you uh, you were in a, an ice bath today like um was it that was today or was that yesterday like i saw on instagram that was and... yesterday yeah if it was okay. on instagram yeah you know the 24-hour story stay up so yeah that was yesterday but i go most days and do that ah, cool, do man. the ice bath yeah yesterday was a cold one it was 
think it was like 38 degrees, <laughs> 38, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was, it was a chilly one. Yeah, yeah. Is that sure. part of your like everyday routine? Like you just you say, this is part of what I do. To Pretty much. Going? Yeah. I mean, I take a cold shower every day for sure. But that's in L.A. The cold water is not that. I mean, to some people it'd be cold. I try to get people to take cold showers here and they're like, they die. But um, <laughs> it's not like if you go to New York City in the winter and take a cold shower. I mean, that's a cold shower. But you don't really get the benefit uh, from a cold shower that you get from the ice bath because you're not submerged, you know. But yeah. I definitely take a cold shower every day. And then the ice bath uh, in question is one that I've set up at my brother's uh, gym. He's got a gym here called Story Fitness that's about a mile from Ooh. my place. And so we fashioned an ice bath out of uh, one of these sort of storage freezers. And so rather than putting a bunch of steaks in the freezer in the garage, as <laughs> people typically do with those horizontally oriented yeah, those uh, deep freeze. freezers. Yeah, the deep freeze. We just we just filled it up with, a you know, got a, sh uh, a filter for the hose to take out the chlorine and the chemicals and stuff, fill it yeah. up, plug it in. And um, cool. yeah, and then that's it. Uh so... I saw so it looked like it was like on the streets or something like that. Well, it's in the parking lot, uh -huh. actually, of Story Fitness. So he's got a little parking lot out in the back. And um, and so that's where we have it. So usually when I go work out or I go do a mobility session over there, we will, you know, just have the ice bath set up and I have it on a timer so that it stays at a certain temperature. And then I'll jump in there usually after I work out as a re as a recovery um, protocol. Yeah. What's crazy you is guys. Like I, I, I went, well, the, I was going to say just in closing, uh, yesterday I worked out for the first time, like a pretty hard 20 minute high intensity workout because I got stem cell treatment in my back recently and it's been pretty sore and you're huh. supposed to take it easy for a while. So I haven't really, I mean, I've moved, but I haven't worked out really hard. And so I, I should be really sore today, but right after I did that workout, which was just a bunch of body weight and sort of strength and conditioning stuff not like heavy lifting weights or anything, but I would still be normally sore after having taken a break for a couple months. And I did that ice bath and today I woke up and I was like, it's so weird. I'm not sore at all. It's just, it's such, <laughs> a, it's such a strange thing to, to be able to just randomly start working out pretty hard. And then the next day you're just totally normal. It's amazing. Yeah. That's and then incredible. you're like, did I work out hard enough? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, wait, did I, was that yesterday? Yeah. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so can you just tell us a little about the stem cell um that what, what's called implant that you had what what is involved well exactly? stem cell treatment you know is a i mean i i guess now it's not really cutting edge but it's it's where they take stem cells from your body at least in the united states they come from your body because there's laws that um you know that the mm -hmm. medical association or fda or whatever has here you can't take them from a monkey or goat or something and put them <laughs> in your an embryo or whatever uh but yeah stem cells are still cells in your body that have not expressed themselves as a body part yet is one simplistic way to state it so say like you were to extract cells from your liver or from any of your organs brain cells for example um, those cells have an expression according to where they exist in the body but stem cells are sort of neutral cells that haven't expressed themselves uh, in accordance with any particular part of your body. And so you can take those stem cells out of your fat or out of your bone marrow. And they're called fat-derived or bone marrow-derived stem cells. They have a fancier scientific name too, of course, that I don't remember. But essentially, they take them out of your back fat, kind of like out of your um, muffin top, you know, if you've yeah. got one. Yeah. you've got. <laughs> And then out of that big hip bone, that big flat bone in your hip. And so uh, I went out to Utah to a place called Docere Clinics and had the stem cells extracted from those two locations in my body. They take them out. They spin them in a centrifuge. They do some stuff to them. And then they inject them back locally in different parts of your body uh, where you've had injuries or pain. And then also just as an IV systemically, uh, which is just kind of an anti-aging protocol. And the reason that I did it is because I've had chronic back pain for 25 years, right in my right SI joint and mm -hmm. also in my right hip. And I'm always just working on different modalities and different ways to alleviate that pain. And stem cell treatment has been one that's been on my vision board or my in my vision journals and my goals for God, at least 10 years, if not more. And um, I finally got in touch with the doctor out there, uh, Dr. Dr. Harry Adelson at Docere, and then uh, his partner, Dr. Amy Killen. And we, um, you know, made arrangements for me to get out there and do the treatment finally. And uh, funny thing about it is that I, 
like everything that I do, as you've seen, uh, like the ice bath is I tend to make content out of all of my adventures. So yeah. I made a, uh, a sort of serial episode of my podcast, the lifestylist on the whole trip. So I did a play by play report from all <laughs> of the biohacking that I did, uh, in preparation and then driving down the freeway, I recorded some more, I recorded some podcasts on the plane and so cool. when I landed and then I got to Utah and went to a hot springs and I recorded there and through one of my listeners on the podcast who took me to the hot springs and then I um, cool. recorded an interview with oh. both doctors and then I went under anesthesia so right after cool. the interview. Yeah. So I made like this, I think it ended up being like a two and a half hour show or something all about the journey. Awesome. And then, and then I live streamed the surgery on Facebook and Instagram, like from the operating room and made a YouTube video uh, showing all the gory stuff involved in the surgery. So yeah, it was, awesome. it was pretty intense. It's funny. I was at a party last night in Venice with, with a bunch of other health and wellness influencers and podcasters. And I went to show someone the YouTube video, which is just kind of a, a mashup edit of all this, the surgery footage. And I, I just turned my head. I can't watch it. You know, I was like, here, you can watch it if you want. But it's so funny because I'm like, you know, basically naked in an operating room on YouTube and I've never seen it. I have no idea what it looks like, what it shows. Oh, what I it didn't show. watch it. Yeah. So anyone interested in stem cell surgery can Google Luke Story stem cell and you'll find the video of me. It's about 15 minutes, which is, you know, it's a couple hour procedure, but it's an edit of some of the parts of the procedure. So, uh, yeah, so I did that really to alleviate pain, but uh, one of the doctors, Dr. Harry, he does pain and injuries, and he's quite successful uh, with that particular protocol. But his partner, Amy, does sexual optimization and anti-aging. Hmm. So while I went there to do my back and my hip primarily and, and my shoulder, where I just have pain and injury kind of stuff going on, they're like, well, hey, Dr. Amy does this thing called the P-Shot which you can guess uh, what P stands for. <laughs> so, so I had stem cells shot in my penis and oh, in, wow. in, in my face. I had microneedling with p something called PRP and um, stem cell treatment on my face and then on my scalp for hair loss. And so I got basically just like the full on uh, treatment. And it's, it's so hopefully that part's not on YouTube. I, I yeah. asked. He's like, you yo, hold, check, up a, hold up a sheet or something, because I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube, you know, yeah. or necessarily <laughs> show my flaccid member on YouTube. Either. Flaccid. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, hopefully <laughs> I was flaccid. I mean, I was unconscious. I don't know <laughs> what kind of dreams I could have been having. But uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's my life, dude, is I just, I experiment with things like that and uh, and help and help people to, um, you know, to discover things that they might not have heard of. So talking about it on your show, someone might say, oh, man, I have back pain and look into stem cell treatment and and go do it. And the more people I think that explore these alternative modalities of healing, uh, whether it be on the physical plane, such as, you know, healing back pain or metaphysical pain and emotional pain of trauma and uh, existential loneliness or whatever it is that you're suffering from that. I can help people find means by which to alleviate their own suffering, you know? So it's really fun to be able to do that for a living. Luke, did you um, actually bank those stem cells as well? Because I was reading something recently that like if you go and get a wisdom to teeth taken out, for example, while they're doing that, they can actually from the pulp or something, they can actually extract stem cells as well and then bank them with the intent that in the future there'll be technologies uh, available that you'll be able to, I mean, in theory, like grow an organ or something from your own stem cells, which won't um, be rejected by your own body if you should need them in the future. So did, did they do that procedure at the same time? Unfortunately, I didn't think of that until after I got back home to LA. <laughs> so no, oh, right. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't bank them because a lot of people asked me that. And I was like, oh, shit. And I knew about that, too. I just I had so much going on trying to I mean, I went out there by myself and I have all my cameras and my recording oh, gear. Yeah. I'm like, you know, being a one man TV show slash radio show and getting the surgery myself. So I totally forgot to ask the doctors about that. And then afterward sure. was reminded by someone like, oh, but, you know, I can always go and do it again. <laughs> but I think it's a good idea. I mean, I just talked to someone who had uh, actually she's got two or three kids. She has a really great uh, wellness clinic called um, Tonic Tonic Wellness Boutique here in Hollywood. It's on Beverly, just for a shout out to them. And I was talking to her just about natural childbirth and vaccines and all this stuff. And 
the topic of stem cells came up and she's like, oh, I banked my uh, kids stem cells for all two or three of my kids. And so they extracted them from the umbilical cord and they're in storage somewhere. Uh She has like some of them frozen in Switzerland and some of them in another country (laughs) in case, you know, in case something happens to the facilities there. Yeah, she's she really took it seriously and is has them, you know, vaulted essentially for for future use. Because, yeah, you take that newborn baby and then they're 18 and they have a snowboarding accident and rip their knee apart or something. Uh, the, uh, the possibilities, especially as you said, in the future are, are pretty exciting in terms of what can be yeah. done with those in the United States. There are more strict laws in terms of, uh, using someone else's stem cells mm. or also, uh, one thing that you're not allowed to do here is to culture and multiply stem cells which Mm. you can do in many other countries. So there's a lot of stem cell tourism in countries like Panama, um, Mexico, Germany, different places around around the globe where you can go have your stem cells extracted and then they culture them and multiply them by millions. So rather than, you know, having 100,000 stem cells shot in your knee, you could go ostensibly to uh, Mexico and have a billion put back in you or whatever the Mm. numbers are, something like that. But it's it's crazy how much... um, the number of them that you can increase. And the reason why the number of them is important is because a lot of them don't make it. So once they get injected into a site locally, a lot of them die before they have a chance mm. to express themselves as new cartilage or ligament or tendon or whatever it is that you're trying to grow or organ or whatever, you know, that's yeah, fascinating stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. It's super fascinating stuff. Like what's going on right now, like sort of with, you know, all the technology and everything like that. I was listening to a podcast uh, this week with a guy called Peter Diamandes and uh, Dan Sullivan. And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Peter's like the, the founder of the Singularity University. And they were talking a lot about um, placenta cells and the placenta and like how um, enriching um, the cells there are. And, and pretty much like in the world, a placenta is like thrown away 99% of the time. Um, but actually if you use it, um, for, you know, you can use it, um, for things like growth and for, uh, longevity and things like that. So they're doing a lot of research into that at the moment, which just sounds like super interesting, you know, making people live yeah. to like they're 150 and all these sort of things. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think as, as these practices become more common and the efficacy of them is is proven over and over again, then the the laws and regulations will loosen up a little bit because it's, you know, there's potential. Um, I guess the FDA and and these these organizations that we have in this country, they're probably uh, in some cases have their heart in the right place. They they're concerned with public safety, so yeah, there could be potential. Um, negative interactions if i was to take stem cells out of someone else's dna like you know my friend has a baby i get their placental stem cells and try to put them in my freaking brain or something you know (laughs) (laughs) something strange could happen so i I think it's just a little more time needs to go by and more research and then this will just become commonplace you know hopefully so yeah it's it's fun but it's it's neat to be sort of able to be on the cutting edge of this kind of stuff and be be the guinea pig because i'm i'm just of the mind that you're, you're going to die eventually anyway. So I'm not, I don't do anything too stupid, but I'm also not overly cautious about stuff like that either. You know, what's interesting, Gareth, is that um, one of my friends is having a, having a baby here on the Gold Coast in Australia. And there's a, the university hospital here is, uh, which is interesting because it's a, you know, it's not just an obscure clinic. It's just like the main clinic and they have, a choice of like a water birth at the at the actual hospital but then they also have an option of the placenta where they you can get given the placenta and then they even give you an option of turning grinding the placenta up drying it and giving it to you in capsule form so that the mom can actually eat it um, which I I think is I mean whatever I don't, I don't know all the research on it and everything and what, yeah. what people are doing exactly but it's kind of cool that a, that a sort of a government hospital is is having these options for people um and uh which like you say is like the way things are moving like there's so much potential that people often like just say no that's weird but then they don't explore the potential of it you know yeah 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 it's amazing there's uh there's a a lot to be said for that whole placenta thing yeah they uh they desiccate it right and they i think they kind Mm. of freeze dry it and dehydrate it and turn it into a powder so that it's still bioavailable yeah it's fascinating I mean, that's yeah. the thing, though, when you're when you're into this kind of stuff, it's, you know, I'm at the moment happen to be single, but 
the more I learn about, especially these different practices of, of childbirth and natural childbirth and some of these more, um, you know, what do you call them? Uh, not grassroots. What's the word I'm looking for? Just traditional mm. practices in childbirth, which have been handed down through many generations. Uh, it's like, you kind of have to find a partner that's on board with that. Stuff, you, <laughs> yeah, know? <that's... laughs> you know, it's like the more I learn, the more I realize, especially when it comes to our our quote unquote modern birthing practices that so many things they do are really, really sketchy with, you know, all of the vaccines and circumcision and just, there's a lot of really gnarly shit that happens that is uh, unsafe and unnecessary. So the more, the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, it's, it's interesting because you would potentially have to find someone who's on board with your <laughs> stance and, and frame of mind on things like that. Like, hey, I, if we ha if we have a kid, it has to be born in a kiddie pool in water. You know, and you have to eat the placenta. I mean, it takes a certain type of woman to get on board with that stuff. You know? Yeah, that's true. But the good news is, is there's like someone for everyone, and you'll you know yeah. you'll definitely yeah. find them by day. For sure, for sure, yeah. But Luke, before we move on from that, uh, I think uh, list, there will be a few listeners that will say like, okay, hang on a second, we we brushed over the P implant or the P injection way too fast. Uh, and so just briefly, what, what is the intent behind that? Is that just to keep it young and healthy and fit? Or is it to like, I don't know, maybe what, what is the sort of intent the, behind that? Well, in, that the injection? P shot is, is um, an extension of the O shot. And the O shot was the first thing they started doing. And that was for vaginal rejuvenation, O standing for orgasm. And so women that were um, getting older or had some kind of sexual dysfunction, it turns out that uh, about 37% of women have some kind of sexual dysfunction. So lack of lubrication, hmm. um, lack of elasticity in their sex organs, things like that, especially in some cases, not just as a result of getting older, but of having multiple kids and things like that. So hmm. the stem cell treatment for the O shot uh, was for vaginal rejuvenation and also for um, just increasing pleasure and the potential for orgasms and multiple orgasms and things like that. And then they started doing the P shot because they thought, well, you know, female sex organs are basically the same exact thing as a male's organs. They're almost just turned inside out, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> really, uh, so they started doing those. And, um, you know, it's funny because people ask me that. And I'm like, I'm not really sure what it's supposed to do. <laughs> I'm just like, hey, sounds good. Yeah, shoot some in there. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I think it's for uh, better erections and longer erections and just mm. sexual performance and um, enhancement of, of one's pleasure. It's just... The, the weird thing about the timing of that is that um, for the first time since 1986, when I was 16 years old and started <laughs> having sexual intercourse, uh, for a number of different reasons, I've chose to be, uh, chosen to be celibate for the past. It's been a little bit over a year now. Wow, so man. when I did stem cell treatment, it was I was maybe 10 months into that period. And, uh, so I don't, I haven't, you know, been able to take it out for a test drive to really see <laughs> what the effects were. And I don't, I don't know when, I don't really have a specific date on when I plan to break this period of, you know, abstinence. It's just, um, I'm just kind of working on myself and, and looking into that part of my life at the moment. And, uh, so not dating or in a relationship or have any plans to be in the near future. So it's, um, it's interesting because Everyone, of course, asked, what did it do? What's it like? I really mm. don't know, you know. We'll have to find out. I didn't have, thankfully, any sort of dysfunction or problems going in that area before, which I'm thankful for. Mm. But, it, again, it was just one of those things where it was offered and kind of thrown into the package deal that I was doing for my back. So I yeah, just yeah. thought, what the hell? But, yeah, I think it's for just, you know, a, a, a blood flow and just yeah. health of the tissue and for things sure. like that, rejuvenating the tissue uh, there and your wedding tackle that with age and perhaps overuse could become worn out or something, you know? Uh, oh, right. So yeah, we'll, we'll find out one of these days, yeah. you know? Cool. So, Luke, I'm actually like sitting with my legs crossed and I'm like tightening my legs. I'm thinking, what, did you get an injection there as well? Is that how you got it done or is it? Yeah, they take oh. the stem cells uh, out of, well, you're under anesthesia though, you okay, know? Yeah. And I mean, that wasn't the half of it. You know, one of the things that I think was the most, uh, well, actually the most painful part of it afterward, after the anesthesia wore off was where they extract the fat derived stem cells from your back fat. Um, that was actually quite bruised and swollen because they use liposuction. So it's kind of a violent procedure to get those fat cells out. 
So that was a little bit gnarly. And then to do the bone derived um, stem cells that they get out of that hip bone, that big plate, they actually take essentially like an ice pick and a hammer and they just tap right through mm. your skin, right into that bone and put a hole in it mm. to, into the bone marrow in the middle of that bone. And then they take a needle and they pull out that bone marrow. So <laughs> all of, I mean, if you think about those two procedures, the extraction is actually much more invasive than yeah. just taking a tiny little needle and injecting them back into your weenie. You know, it's not, <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't choose to have a needle put in my, in my private parts, but that part is actually no big deal. And you're, you're under anesthesia. And, and even afterward, there was no swelling or any kind of sign that anything had happened there. They could have done it to me and not told me and I would have no idea. Okay. But my face getting the micro needling in my face, there was a lot of bruising. I had two black eyes for about a week and wow. it looked like I'd been in a, in a motorbike accident or something. You know, I had like kind of scabs and was all scratched up on my face and stuff. So that wow. was actually a little bit more. Uh, you know, visual trauma that you could see than the actual pee shot. The pee shot was incidentally one of the least invasive parts of the whole wow. thing. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man. Well, your your levels of attention are certainly going to be going up soon because uh, uh, you've got a little uh, companion with you there today. You were telling us about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I have I have this dog uh, that I don't. Let me see if I can grab her. Hang on one sec, because you guys. <laughs> Tired. Yeah, this is. Uh, oh, you guys see her? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, she looks like she's, she's a little cutie. So I, you know, uh, I, I used to have really weird relationships with dogs. Uh, I'd been attacked by a number of dogs throughout my life, and wow. was not that in, down with them. You know, they weren't down with me, so I wasn't down with them. We had somewhat of an adversarial relationship, to say the least. And then a number of years ago, I was living with a girlfriend, and we were together for five years in total. But about maybe three years into that relationship she just kept fucking you know nagging me and nagging me to get her a dog get her a dog she just wouldn't let it go and at that point i was not that excited about the prospect of having kids so i thought well at least she's at one point i was like at least she's just asking for a dog if i get her the dog it'll probably put off the kid thing for a while and then so i got her this dog and it, i just fell in love with this dog it's a papillon and i, I still see the dog regularly Actually, God, it's so crazy. Last night, that dog got attacked by a pit bull. And oh, is, my God. Now, yeah, after we get off the call, I have to go check on that dog. Yeah, and Shame. she got oh, bit wow. in the hand trying to rescue it. And so there was a lot oh. of drama last oh, night. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's crazy. She is. Thankfully, it's okay. Uh, but anyway, that was my first introduction back into dogness. And I mm. just loved that dog. His name's Yoji. He's a little papillon, and he just has the best <laughs> personality. So I've been just... And then we broke up, you know, and so the dog went with her, obviously, because it was technically her dog. And I get to see it sometimes because <laughs> we work together. But I just have been thinking for a while, man, I I really would like to have a dog. But it's, the, of course, the commitment issue is terrifying because <laughs> I'm just a very free spirited person living in L.A. Yeah. And I do what I want when I want. I'm an, I work for myself. I'm an entrepreneur. And I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not accountable really to a lot other than just the stuff that I have to get done. Yeah. Uh, on my own volition, but my ex, who was attacked by the pit bull last night with her dog, mm. sent me this picture the other day of this one that you see in in front of you, or that you saw a moment ago. And I don't know, dude. I just saw the face, and I was like, God damn it! And so I just thought, well, <laughs> I, I applied for. It's called foster to adopt, you know, and that's where you take a dog for a p couple of weeks, and you know, you just take care of it while it's up for adoption, and then if you so choose to. Uh, keep the dog yourself, then you can adopt the dog. So I applied and I figured it's so cute. A bunch of other people must have applied and they called me right back. Yeah. And they're like, oh, pick it up tomorrow. Wow. It's like, oh, oh shit. Wow. Yeah. I was like, I wasn't, I didn't mean it, you know. <laughs> take back, take back. So I, went and, I went and picked her up yesterday from the spade, a spade and neuter clinic way out in the valley, which doesn't mean anything to you guys. You're not from here, but it was about an hour outside of LA. I drove out there and she was in her little crate and she's kind of smelly and a flea oh, jumped off thing. her right away when I got her. <laughs> she just had surgery. So she's all out of it. You know, it wasn't, you know, didn't have a lot of personality. So I've been nursing her back to health for about 24 hours now. And, and she, she seems to really like being next to me and in my lap and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking a liking to her so far, but oh. it's difficult to tell what her personality is really like because she's still kind of out of it and a bit traumatized from that surgery. And sure. Who knows, you know, how many people she's been passed around to or whatever. So 
Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. the dog story. But yeah, crazy that dog Yoji that got he got attacked last night. So I was up till one in the morning running to the hospital and checking on them and all that. And uh a couple of years ago he was also attacked by two German shepherds and Jeez. almost got killed. So this is like his second near brush mm-hmm. with death. It's insane. And he's only oh, six man. pounds. He survived oh, two wow. German shepherds. Wow. And then last night he survived, knock on wood, uh, an attack from a pit bull. I'm like, this poor Jeez. dog. <laughs> now we're even. I've been attacked by two really big, vicious dogs in my life, and so has the six-pound Yoji. So it's um, wow. kindred poor spirits thing. are, are victim <laughs> <by> a big, <laughs> mean dog. Wow. Hey, yeah. hey but do you, before we, like, you know, go on to you and a bit more of your story, I'm really, i just like to sure. stop a little bit at the, the abstinence that you've, sort of been doing for the last year and a bit now like what what, what's the thinking behind it and like what sort of led to it well i just want to i'm doing an experiment to see if i can go long enough to have a wet dream (laughs) 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 i just want to see your face you're like no uh geez surely you've had plenty already (laughs) it's not it's not at all uh you know, it's not. It has nothing to do with any sort of morality or, or anything or health or anything like that. Really, what it is is I just I've evolved a lot in the past few years, and you know, the way that I used to relate with my own sexuality was very free spirited and just you know, I felt as long as I was um, being honest with women that I was dating and was acting out of integrity that I could just kind of be free and I had open relationships and, um, you know, polyamorous relationships and all this kind of stuff and experimented with so many different styles of relationship and, uh, was always quite liberal with sex and did it quickly. When I met someone that I liked, it was like, well, you know, the object for me usually was to jump into it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And then over the past few years, as I've been doing the practices I do, like kundalini yoga and a number of different things and all sorts of meditation and stuff that really raise your consciousness and vibration, uh, that sort of behavior became unappealing to me and unrewarding and just flat. And so I started looking into having deeper levels of intimacy and relationship and had a couple attempts at, well, not attempts, I mean, I had a couple relationships. They weren't attempts. They were relationships uh that were meant to be deeper and more meaningful and uh, more sacred and monogamous and i was actually really into that idea but those relationships started out with sex and uh in my experience it's difficult to really see what is being offered from a partner and really be clear about what I'm able to offer when that comes into the equation so quickly. Yeah. And so I had a couple experiences that had a lot of great moments and were very fulfilling in many ways, but ultimately didn't work out and were painful to a degree, probably for both parties. And, um, the common denominator in those types of experiences is, not building a relationship and a friendship and a level of intimacy first, but like having sex, having chemistry, having that excitement, and then using that as a foundation Mm -hmm. to then try to build a deeper connection, you know, and that probably works for a lot of people. Who's to say that that couldn't work for me again. But the last couple experiences I had using that sequence left me, um, (laughs) left me unsatisfied, you know, and I have yeah. just some patterns there in my life. And so there have been a couple of situations, for example, in the past year where I've met someone and thought, oh, they're attractive, just a, whatever, a girl in my social circle or whatever. And um, thought, oh, they're attractive and maybe I'll just go to coffee with them or something like that. But if I really look at them, they're not a potential long-term okay. partner type person for whatever reason, just their age or wherever they are in their life or lifestyle or the value system that they apparently live by maybe isn't in alignment with mine. And then the old me would have just been like, well, we can just go fuck around and have sex mm. then <laughs> and just not get in a relationship. But what I've found is that um, for whatever reason, I've just kind of changed and evolved and matured a bit without trying to over the past few years so that the prospect of going and just having what you'd call casual sex with someone that I'm not involved with or have no plans of getting involved with on a deeper level 
is just um, not attractive to me. So for me to sort of observe those patterns and really recalibrate myself, it's sort of like when you have to restart your computer. I'm looking at a big iMac computer, and when this thing gets buggy and starts acting up, what do you do? You restart it. You just shut the whole shit down, and then you restart yeah. and open the applications that are serving you, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, for me, it's just it's a reset to really inventory myself and get to know myself and um, not have the distractions of flirting and that, you know, the dings oh, on yeah. your phone from the dating app and from Instagram and that whole game uh, of putting energy into that because – the more shallow experience of a relationship is not what I want. I really crave having a deeper, more meaningful connection. And so taking a break from the whole thing, not just sex, just I don't even hang out with women at all, okay. you know, unless it's for business or something like that. Um, so now I have a much more clear, after a year, a much more clear picture of the patterns that I had in my life that I developed that weren't serving me that didn't achieve the goal that I wanted, which is like a healthy, long-term, exclusive relationship. And so now the patterns are very clear. I've broken those patterns successfully. I'm now in complete control and dominion over those drives that I have, and I can use my wisdom and my higher mm. intelligence to make decisions that are based on everyone's highest good, not just like a temporary fleeting satisfaction for either party and I'm also uh, becoming increasingly clear about what I have to offer in a relationship and my own value and worth as a man and what I'm able to contribute and what my boundaries are and what my limits are and what I'm um, able and willing to not only contribute but also to accept from the partner and mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm really clear on what I want and I'm really clear on what I'm able to give. And for me, that wouldn't have been possible if I was still just running around dating and just having fun and just saying, well, I just got out of a relationship, so I'm not going to get in another relationship, but I can just fuck around and date and have sex mm. indiscriminately. It was necessary to just take a huge pause on all of that and reevaluate. And so that's what I've been doing. And when I first did that, I thought, I, I thought, well, I, I think I see, yeah, I set a commitment for six months, which would have been this past January 1st <laughs> and then January. And then it was very, it's really easy to do that because I was just kind of on the mend and it was a really painful, mm -hmm. you know, experience to end a relationship and recover from the, the grief of that loss and everything like that. And, um, and then in January I thought, oh, wow, I could, I'm, I'm free. I have fulfilled my own commitment to myself. Yeah. I was like, oh God, I'm so not ready for that at all and just did not feel in that space there was a lot more work to be done on myself before I felt ready to go out there and, and do the thing and so uh, you know now we're I don't know 12 13 months or whatever it's been and I still feel like in no hurry at all to get out there I'm still kind of really working on myself and reading a lot of books about relationships and sex and intimacy and codependency and all these kind of things mm -hmm. and just really wanting to get um, clarity and recovery in that area of my life just to keep my own side of the street clean and know what I'm dealing with within myself. But obviously you can't learn how to have a relationship by being celibate and single. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, the real work will come whenever I get out there and start dating and, you know, enter into a relationship or relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously that's when I'll really do the learning, but it's great to be able to take a break and at least get mm -hmm. my own energy in alignment and uh you know i think that's super get honest Jeez. get honest with myself about you know where i am in my own evolution because oftentimes a lot of the things that i'm doing just like i said the the kundalini yoga and the breath work and the prayer and all the spiritual practices and interviewing all of these spiritual masters on my show and and relationship experts and things like that uh, oftentimes i'm just so sort of caught up in living life i'm unable to detect the changes in evolution within myself because it's just life's moving and it's very fluid and it takes a little bit of an upset for me to go, Oh, whoa, shit. I'm not like I used to be. I'd say I go and just have, you know, a totally honest, but just sexual exchange with a woman or something, which I used to be able to do and I'd be fine. It felt great. It was, we're both happy. It's fun. There's no weird shit. There's no one's lying or abusing anyone or doing anything funky. And that used to be great. And then at a certain point, it was like, 
I would try that and I was like, oh God, this feels like shit. I really don't like this anymore. What has happened to me? <laughs> it's just so weird. <laughs> but it's not like I tried to change it. There was no point when I was, you know, in my early forties when I thought, okay, you know what? I should stop running around like this because it's wrong or something like that. I just, all of a sudden I found, wow, I really don't enjoy this anymore. I don't like where this ends up. The feeling the next day is just like, uh, I don't, I don't, it's not what yeah. I want to spend time doing, you know? And again, it's not a moral issue. It's just, it's an energy thing. And I like to be really high energy and high vibration and that type of um, behavior for me at this point, for whatever reason, is just not in alignment with my highest good. So how do you not do that? Well, you stop doing everything and just rebuild and start over and build a new way, uh, a new way of operating install a new operating system so that's kind of what i'm doing now but i i haven't turned it on and used that operating system yet so i have no idea <laughs> yet how to how that's going to work out and it's exciting and terrifying at the same time to think about the prospect of entering back into that part of my human experience and not really knowing how to do it a new way i only know how to do it the old way and so having abandoned the old way i'm going to have to learn a new way which is what's coming up next for me yeah. yeah. Well, that's super cool, man. I, I love it. Like, it's just so cool how we evolve as, as people, you know, and grow and, and try new things and stuff. And you, you certainly like to try lots of new things, that's for sure, which we will get onto just now. But like, you know, you definitely lived a massively colorful life. And it's probably like, yeah, I got that right. It's probably the complete opposite to what it is now. I mean, um, yeah. I was listening to to you on a podcast. I think it was the Mind Pump podcast. Um, oh and, yeah, I just saw those guys last night. Yeah, I saw you. That's you at the event last night. I saw that massive yeah. fireplace. It looked, looked yeah, awesome, yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, and yeah, so, so I was listening to your podcast with them, and I, and and it was like, whoa! All of a sudden, it hit this one point, and you started talking about your up, upbringing and your childhood and stuff. And I was like, jeepers! I'm listening to. Anthony Keeley's here from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It literally sounded like the same sort of story. Like I, it was crazy, um, you know. And obviously, part of our podcast is is understanding people and what makes them, you know, who they are and ridiculously human. So, do you mind taking us back, you know, to that time? I know you said it was early on when your folks got divorced. You're about three years old, and yeah, it just kind of, you know, things picked up for you very early on at a young age. So yeah, just take us yeah. back through that journey. Yeah, I, I do have a, uh, a story that's full of texture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's funny though, because as we all, I'm sure have experienced it sometime, your life is just your life. And I don't know, I don't think about it in terms of it being that extraordinary or, or interesting even, it just is what it is. But then I share some of the things that I've experienced <laughs> in my life with other people and they're like, whoa, oh my God, you've had an insane <laughs> life. And then I stop and go, yeah, I guess it's kind of uncommon that you'd experience some of the things that I did. But yeah, yeah. To, uh, to give the short version of the story, if that's at all possible, and it's hard, you know, I'm 47 years old, so it's like there's been a lot of life. It, it, it's sometimes difficult to, to summarize it. Mm. And then if, but if I don't try to do that, then an hour and a half goes by and I'm only yeah. gotten to 12 years old, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, no, no, totally, totally. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just in a nutshell, you know, I was, I was born to a lineage of people that had a lot of problems and uh, a family that was what we would call pretty dysfunctional, you know, just a lot of alcoholism going back generations in my family and my mom was from Berkeley, California, grew up there in the 60s and was kind of a quasi hippie and my dad was um, uh, born and raised in Colorado and was like a mountain man you know was into rodeos and hunting and fishing and things like that and my parents met and it was like hippie meets cowboy and uh, they had me and they lived in Aspen Colorado and I lived there uh, until I was I don't know three four five something like that I don't even know how old I was exactly they got divorced my mom took me to California and I grew up mostly there with her and Back in California, we lived in a lot of lower income areas and I was exposed to a lot of low energy people and suffered some pretty severe abuse there. And immediately upon the abuse that I was uh, subject to, started having a lot of behavioral problems and was, you know, committing arson and reading pornography and vandalism and violence at school and just started having all of these problems because I didn't know 
how to express or process the things that I was experiencing, you know, and, uh, and so that eventually at a pretty early age led to getting into drugs as, as a means by which to cope with the trauma and the shame and all of the, the hurt that I experienced as a result of the abuse. And so I became a drug addict at a really early age and that led me into getting into crime and breaking into houses and doing all the things that I had to do in order to supply myself with my anesthesia, you know? And wow. so, uh, as a result of becoming a drug addict very young and having a lot of problems with the law, as a result, I was sent away to this cult like boarding school in Northern Idaho in the middle of nowhere when I was 14, because I was just out of control and I uh, had a number of felonies on my record and was on probation and was put in a position where either I had to leave the state of Colorado where I'd been sent to at that time to live with my dad, or they were going to put me in a children's uh, correctional facility, which is essentially like an underage penitentiary until I was 18 and I was only 14. Wow. So they're like the last court appearance wow. I had, they said, we'll let you out of here today. But if you so much as jaywalk, we're going to hit you with all of the felonies that you have and breaking probation and then we're going to lock you up in this facility until you're 18 or you can leave the state and just get out of this county and get out of our hair basically the judge just judge didn't like me and i found out later the judge had a beef with my dad aspen is in a small oh, town wow. in colorado wow. and this is the early 80s and the guy hated my dad they had had run-ins at city council meetings or whatever you know they had some <laughs> other beef so when i walked in there with all these you know burglary and grand theft and all these charges he was pretty keen on getting me out of there um so yeah it was like you know some small town politics there but anyway they shipped me off <laughs> to the school and i was you know thank god i got sent to that school it really it was a very when i say a cult-like school there was a lot of practices there that were very unorthodox and i think the quote unquote teachers and the therapists there were not um credentialed in any way and were just kind of like Ex hippies that got into all of these um, somewhat uh, experimental methodologies in terms of personal development and therapy and things like that. And so there were situations like um, they'd throw you out in the woods for three days by yourself and you have to build a snow cave and you had no contact wow. with anyone. And, what? you know, they give you like a little lantern and, wow. <laughs> and you just. It was to build your self-esteem and stuff like that. Just, Jesus. I mean, I could go on and on. We could do a five-hour show just about that particular wow. school. But on the on the positive sense of that, I was I was reformed to a large degree, and um, and I came out of that form that school, and I and I got back into drugs, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, because I didn't I didn't you know that one thing that wasn't part of their model was the addiction and alcoholism recovery model. They didn't. They weren't well versed in that. They didn't understand that it was more about behavior modification. So I came out and I was a good kid. I stopped robbing houses and <laughs> stealing things and, and, and doing, you know, crimes of that nature that were against other people. But I got into drugs and then eventually that led me to moving to Hollywood when I was 19 years old. And then I really went crazy. I got a fake ID and I started playing in rock and roll bands and hanging out with all of these rock stars that I had, you know, worshipped in high school and just had this really f fun but tragic existence in Hollywood for six years and, um, you know, had some really close calls of success in the music industry and things just kind of eventually started circling the drain and I became really, really sick physically and emotionally and mentally and still hadn't really dealt with a lot of the stuff from my childhood in a way that was... Mm meaningful and um and um final you know there's a lot of unresolved issues there and it was just terribly toxic in every way imaginable and then when i was 26 i hit a place of existential despair that was just like no other that i'd felt before and i made a decision to put myself in treatment and to and to sober up, you know, and so I did. I checked into a place and I spent 28 days there. And in there I had a really profound um, spiritual experience where I prayed maybe for the first time earnestly in my life. <clears throat> Although I wasn't really spiritual or religious prior to that, it was like um, what they call, they call a foxhole God. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> when you're, you know, no one believes in God until you're in war yeah. and you're in the foxhole. Then it's like, Jesus, save me. You know, <laughs> exactly. So I prayed to this sort of ambiguous higher power god thing whatever it was and and i was 
that day, you know, that February 15th, 1997, I was struck sober and, uh, and have been ever since it's 21 Jeez. years later and no way. never once again had a craving for drugs or alcohol or anything. It was just put in this strangely protective bubble and then got really involved from that point in health and spirituality and, uh, just doing detoxes and cleanses and saunas and all of the health fads that were in vogue in the late nineties. Mm. And, uh, and also going to India and learning to meditate and just really, really working on myself because I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be healthy and more than anything in the world, I wanted to remain sober. And so huh. I just pursued and continued to pursue my own health and well-being with a vengeance, you know. And uh, so that was kind of going on, on on the inside of my life. And uh, during that early period when I first was relieved of that um, deadly obsession for drugs. I also got a job working as an assistant fashion stylist, uh, working for Aerosmith stylist. And then wow. at the same time, while I was playing music, I was catapulted into the entertainment industry, working for musicians like that and went on to uh, eventually become a fashion stylist myself. And I did that for 17 years here in LA and just dressed hundreds and hundreds of amazing artists, musicians and actors and things like that. And, uh, and that became my <laughs> career. And all the while, while I was doing that, I was practicing all of this metaphysical and physical health uh, regimens and things like that and really working on myself. But it was just a private thing that I did. And I helped some friends and family out with here and there. And then uh, two years ago, I has reached a point where I, finished, I felt like I had kind of accomplished whatever I could accomplish in that particular career and was seeking to do something that was more in alignment with my my real passion, which is... Uh, helping people with health and spirituality and things like that. And so I started the Lifestylist podcast and uh, and now I've turned that into kind of at 45 years old, did a rebrand and a reboot of my whole professional life. And now I'm doing this and retired from being a fashion stylist. And and now I, um, you know, I curate lifestyle practices for myself and share those with people to help to help them grow and to help them alleviate suffering. And uh and in closing that story, there's a, another piece of it, which is pretty relevant. And that's 10 years ago, I started a fashion school called School of Style. And that was based on the experience I had as a fashion stylist. And I started teaching students how to do that for a living. And uh, that was my, well, it wasn't my first entrepreneurial venture. My first one was dealing drugs. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was kind of how I learned how to be your own boss. Um, but obviously that, you know, has a lot of potential risks and there's a huge downside to being an, an yeah. illegal. Drug but, you know, I, I kind of knew how to market myself, so to speak, and, um, and market a product or service. And so I started this school and uh, that's still going to this day right now. As we speak, we're in wow. the middle of launching our second online course of 2018. Uh, we just wow. are in the middle of the launch right now. And um, at the beginning of this year, we transitioned from doing live classes, which we had done for the previous nine years, and now we just do online classes. So cool. uh, I was very fortunate to have um, a good, solid, profitable business that was able to support me as I transitioned into doing my podcast and making a go of it here. And now the podcast and the other speaking events and coaching and things that I do are also a second business. And so I'm really kind of fortunate to be able to have, you know, have that midlife reboot of my career and have some security there and not just have to go, you know, live on someone's couch until I figured out how to monetize a podcast. Yeah. You know? So that kind of brings us up to where we are. And I'm, I'm just now I'm living the dream and just continuing to work on myself and share whatever I find that I think is useful with other people. It's awesome. Yeah. I find that such an inspiring story because there's so many facets to it, obviously, but the main theme for me is that you can, people can change, people can evolve through a process of going inward and, and wanting to grow and learn and change, which, I, you know, I used to think people don't change. I used to think, oh, that's it, that's who you are, you know, and but you're a real testament to like coming full circle and helping others now and using that that spirit that you've got in a real focused and positive way, which I, which I think is really cool. But, you know, I always like to find out a little bit more about someone's music background because both of us are, love our music. And you mentioned that you, you know, you had some, you played in some bands with some of your idols. 
uh, what were the influences in your life uh, musically at that time? <laughs> and then, and then that that, that's funny. I've done one guest spot on a show that was about music, actually. <laughs> and uh, and I got to go into all the music stuff. It was great because it's something oh, I'm still awesome. passionate about. I mean, I still play, you know, just yeah. at home for my own pleasure. I just picked up a harmonica and I've been practicing that. And I play guitar and I cool. played bass was my main instrument that I played oh, yeah? in bands for 15 years. But yeah, when I when I moved to L.A., um, oh God, I had so many different incarnations of music. But when I moved to L.A. when I was 19, I was really into um, the Ramones and Iggy Pop and uh, the New York Dolls and David Bowie and T-Rex and the Rolling Stones and a lot of that 70s rock. That was kind of my high school thing. Punk rock before that and then more kind of the glam rock stuff. And there was a band called Hanoi Rocks that I was really into. They were from Finland and they were like the precursor to Guns N' Roses. They were the band that Guns N' Roses really modeled themselves after oh. Uh, oh, in wow. addition to Aerosmith. And Aerosmith was another one of my favorites. So I kind of moved here into all of that. And then right when I moved here, I met people from many of those bands and ended up, uh, you know, hanging out with one of the guys from Guns N' Roses quite a bit and a lot with the guys from the band Hanoi Rocks and at one point got to jam with uh, a couple members of the New York Dolls that hadn't even been in the <laughs> same room with one another in 20 years wow. or something. Just It's just kind of part <laughs> wow. of the scene. Uh, another time when I was 19, uh, Johnny Thunders, who was the guitar player for the New York Dolls, uh, ended up at my house at a party. I mean, I'm 20 years old. Like <laughs> A year ago, I'm living at wow. my mom's house with uh, Johnny Thunders posters all over my room, and then a year later, <laughs> I'm in Hollywood, and we're partying in my living room of this flop house that I moved into, you know, so <laughs> had a lot of crazy experiences like that. And then and played in one band uh, with these other guys from Finland who were in a band called Smack, which is really obscure to most people. But this was one of my favorite bands in high school. And again, I had all their records, all their posters, moved to Hollywood, met them and their uh, their guitar player, Ron A, who's you know, still a dear friend of mine, although he lives in Helsinki now again. Uh, <laughs> He taught me how to play bass, you know, because I was I was like the younger kid that hung out with all the older musicians and sold them drugs, basically. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. And so I was always, you know, that's, I guess, part of my social value that I was able to add. But I was always like I looked up to all of them so much and I always wanted to play in a band. And my friend Ron A was just he got tired of me, like talking about that dream I was like, listen, I'm going to teach you how to play bass and then we'll come to a band. <laughs> And so I picked bass because it has four strings and it's probably <laughs> the easiest thing to learn, I think, and get into a band quickly. <laughs> and then I played bass and I just loved it. I love playing bass and uh, and did that for, you know, like 15 years. So that was in the in the drug years. I had some really great experiences like that. Um, you know, there was one time where our drummer got sick and so we had the drummer from Motorhead fill in, Filthy oh, wow. Phil, since Phil Taylor, who since died. But again, that was like a band I grew up with. And then yeah. now I'm like in rehearsal, sitting there playing bass Crazy. with Motorhead. Just weird stuff like that. But again, because of the drugs, because every one of those people were you know, addicted to crystal meth or heroin or crack or alcohol, wow. or in some cases, all of those, there was just yeah. this, this constant like sadly ironic failure motif to that career. It's like, we get so close, yeah. we get so close, we got a record deal and then we'd get dropped, you know? And yeah. wow. I, I remember once we played a gig wow. and uh, this producer, Tim Palmer, who had just produced a bunch of stuff with David Bowie's group called Tin Machine. And Tim Palmer was a really big producer at the time. And I was kind of the band leader in the sense that I was in charge of our marketing and stuff like that, which was, you know, just a total farce looking back because I was such a basket case. But <laughs> but I was the one that made the flyers and booked the gigs and kind of was like sort of our manager in a sense, you know, not the mm. music leader, but the leader just making sure shit got done. <laughs> and so which I guess was kind of like running a business in a sense as poorly as I did it. It was some experience I had in managing a group of people and trying to accomplish an objective. But anyway, Tim Palmer comes up and gives me his card and is like, hey, you guys are onto something really special and uh, I want to record some demos with you. I think we can get a deal. And I was like, great, awesome, man. <laughs> you know, and then went home and then just lost the card and, you know, oh, went on no. a crack. Yeah, and I just, oh, I, you know, the band's like, hey, well, let's call that guy. I was like, yeah, I lost the card. We have no way to reach him. This oh, is shit. free internet. So it was like, you could Google his production Oh company. my God. Just, so there was just, so many sad, sad um, turns of uh, events like that. And, uh, you know, and those dreams just kind of were slipping through the cracks and, and never really came mm -hmm. to fruition. And then when I got sober, I got in a band 
I played in a number of different bands. I played, um, you know, with a, a guy named Wayne Kramer from a band called MC5. And did a gig with him, which was amazing. That was another band I listened to when I was a kid. They were ostensibly <laughs> the first punk rock band. They were from Detroit. And uh, I mean, wow. you know, again, I listened to them every day through my whole high school years. And then I'm like playing a gig with him. So I had some really wow. cool things like that. But after I got sober, I got in a band. It was called Stew Boss, S-T-E-W-B-O-S-S. No one's ever heard of us, I don't think. But <laughs> uh, with that band, we had a little following in the UK. Oh, and so, oh, wow. yeah. And so I did for five years, I did five tours of the UK and ventured out into Europe a little bit. And I, I really got a taste of what it's like to, you know, go do radio shows and do gigs where people want you to sign CDs and T-shirts and uh -huh. It cool. was really, really fun. But at the end of the day, I, I realized after that five years that I was also a stylist at the same time. So it was great because I could go on tour for four or six weeks in the UK and then we wouldn't make as much money as I made here as a stylist. I mean, I'd make as much in four weeks as I'd make in one day here just by comparison. <laughs> wow! But I could come back and just jump back in my career because I was a freelance artist here as a stylist. So I, I kind of did both of those things for a number of years and it was pretty cool. But at the end of the day, it's just like I'm too into health to be on tour. Like I've got to have yeah. my health food and spring water and a good bed. And, <laughs> you know, just my environment is really important to me. And I just actually hated being on tour. I I like to travel here and there, but I'm, I'm kind of a homebody, you know. Yeah. Mm. So eventually I really looked at the music thing and it wasn't just the going on tour, but I got more skilled at examining my motives and why I do the things I do. And at some point it was just like, huh, why do I play in a band? And as I started to do more self inquiry, a lot of playing music for me was just because I had low self worth and it was something that made me feel like I belonged to something or made me feel like I had some sort of value because I really didn't feel that on the inside. But if I could play in a band and dress really cool and be like this rock and roll guy, then that was really this identity that I had built, this egoic kind of identity. Mm. And I started to see that while I love music, a lot of the motivation to play in bands was just to be cool and to be liked and, and all of that. Once I became aware sure. of that, it was really difficult to keep doing it. You know, it was just, yeah. it was like, oh shit, I see through the, the facade of this motive and now <laughs> I don't want to do it anymore. And so I stopped. And now it's crazy because now I love sitting around playing music, but I would wow. never band, you know, just like, oh, good <laughs> practice. Oh, my God. What a horrible uh, idea. <laughs> it's like, oh, packing up all my shit. In <laughs> oh, my God. Away from home for two months. It's like, no, no way. way. It's not it's not for me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, the, that was the, the musical journey. But I still, you know, I still really identify with music. And I, I really feel there's a tremendous healing spiritual power in music and certainly yeah. music and aside from drugs music is how I really survived my childhood and my adolescent years and teen years because music was my it was my savior man because of the the spiritual power and energy within music and I always talk about you know the first time I heard bands like Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix mm. and Rolling Stones and Black Sabbath and like all those 70s kind of rock bands i mean that changed my life and it made my childhood tolerable because so i had my yeah. Yeah, you had these things called a walkman you know which is like yeah, yeah. <laughs> before you had a uh an, you know, an, what do they call it I, yeah. so i'd have my headphones and my walkman i had my <laughs> my hard rock and heavy metal tapes and uh, you know this is from seven years old to 14 or something like that and i was just oh i was just in heaven as long as i had that music on yeah it fueled me and it gave me this sense of connection, you know, and I never felt alone when I had that music. And so I've always had a very close relationship with it based on that. Yeah. But to go play in a band and stuff, oh man, yeah, that's, <laughs> no that's, way. that's, a, that's a, <laughs> a certain type of person, a diehard. You know, my friend Ron A yeah. that I was talking about that taught me how to play bass in 1990, uh, he's been playing in bands ever since. Now he's back in Finland and Helsinki. He's in a really popular band over there. And, um, plays music every day, tours all the time, loves it. It's constantly recording, practicing, doing the whole thing. And there are certain musicians, I think, that are just born to do that. And I don't think I was one of those ones. I was born to have that experience for a little bit and go, yeah, I'm not one of those people that just lives for music and I'm willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary in order to 
make that a sole uh, vocation. Like, I don't want to be on stage under all that blue light at night. <laughs> Even, you know, I was oh like, my God. Yeah. Staying up past 11, you know, it's like, crazy. Yeah, I, crazy. I, care too, I care too much about my health. It's going to interrupt my meditation. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the story of music. And thanks for asking because it was yeah. a, a really important part of my life. And I did spend 15 years really, really dedicated to, to music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I so mean, good. Mu- music, like Craig said, it's massive for both of us. And uh, just like what you said today, like music has just been, I think, in humans' bones since, you know, day X, whatever. Like today I was actually um, underneath, I was in the park here in Greenwich and I was just like doing some meditation and I put some native Indian music in my in my ears while I was doing it. And I just, it literally just took me away, you know, somewhere else, which was really amazing. But um i just wanted to just 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 stay on the music for a second uh it's so interesting like uh listening to what you said about like bands that are from other countries and like people will never know about them or anything like that and we had a great example in south africa i'm not too sure if you've seen the movie uh, sugar man yet oh yeah it? yeah yeah oh, yeah how, how crazy <laughs> is that man like I swear, like he was massive in South Africa, yeah. <laughs> like, like huge. And he didn't have a clue. It was just like, it was, it was just so amazing. You know what I mean? Like how people can have this huge following somewhere else, but like not be known in their own town. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that, that uh, was a great documentary. And what an amazing musician. What's his name? Rod- Rodriguez. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. What a fantastic musician, too. That was... <laughs> Yeah. That was a beautiful film because here's someone who's just insanely talented that have been essentially overlooked in, in this country and in Western <laughs> culture by and large, with the exception of South Africa, as you said, yeah. and was just yeah. phenomenally talented. I mean, it was just yeah. amazing watching that going, oh, what the hell? How did we miss this? Like, what <laughs> went wrong? It is uh, such so a, an anomaly of a situation in the music industry that that, that guy did not achieve any real degree of fame anywhere else it's insane yeah and you, you know that gareth that only you know it's funny because <laughs> i literally only like knew, found that out like fairly recently but like i truly believe that this guy was just like an international star <laughs> really? and then someone's like someone when i was over living over i think in australia someone's like oh you you probably watched that f- film uh sugar man right yeah. and and I was like, oh, no, I have no idea. And then I, I was like literally blown away because I was like, that can't be true because he was such a hit in South Africa. I was like, we were so insulated. Eh? Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. He was bigger but than Luke, Elvis uh, and uh, like yeah. Cliff Richard and whoever, all those guys, like yeah. much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Actually, I was just thinking now, my one of my favorite bands, Tool, is um, from LA, actually. We are now. So yeah. it's kind of cool. I've been trying to like, see them live that's like one of my bucket list things to do before and that was one of those bands that i grew up listening to just as a youngster when you like got all this crazy stuff going on in your head and you know some some band catches your ear and, and that's one of them for sure and it's and they're there where you guys are yeah i have an interesting i think weird uh correlation between tool some of the guys from tool were in a band called a perfect circle as well that's right right yeah. The theme yeah. song on my podcast, the it's like a blues riff that's recurring. It's like the theme song on my show was written and performed by a musician here named Jordy White, who's a friend of mine, who was in a perfect circle. No way. No way. So, yeah, so there's Whoa. your he's, – he's most famous cool. for being in Marilyn Manson. He's one of the founding members of Marilyn Manson, but he was also in a perfect circle. So. Wow, you yeah, see, so there's there your, uh, six degrees of separation, man. Right? Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Your dream funny, might right? come true, <laughs> Craig. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, and and so Luke, uh, like, if we move on to like your fashion um, stylish uh, stylist career, uh, what exactly does it mean, like dressing somebody? To me, it like it. I, I mean, you know, it, it sounds like a like a strange thing to do, but obviously, it's a huge, yeah. massive industry, and you've also well, wor- you've also worked with, you know top names out there what are they like to work with well to clarify the first part of the question of what it actually is because whenever i tell someone that i used to be a fashion stylist they 
often say, oh, so you make clothes, you're a designer? I'm like, yeah. no, yeah. God, no, it's, so, it's, it's, like, it's so annoying. I'm like, why do people have such a hard time getting this? You dress people, you put clothes on people. Fuck, it's really irritating. That's 17 years of trying to explain it to anyone that's not from LA. Oh my so God. it's very easy to explain. Okay, so you ever watched a music video? Guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, <laughs> every music video you've ever watched in your life hired someone to come in and put the clothes on those people whether the stylist picked the clothes or just was in charge of making sure that people changed and wore what they're supposed to wear every movie you've ever seen every tv show tv and film is more of a costume designer but essentially there's someone that dresses the people every television com television commercial um every politician every uh, advertisement you see on the internet or on a billboard or in a magazine someone has dressed those people every time a celebrity is on the red carpet for a premiere a stylist has dressed them. Anytime you look at a fashion magazine and you look at the spreads in there, whether it be men in GQ or women in Vogue, a stylist or what they call a fashion editor in the editorial world has dressed those people. So essentially what a stylist does is is given you booked a job, let's say it's a music video, you're given a directive by the management from the label and um, or the management of the artist and from the record label and the director of the video and the artist in the video and they say this is the concept there's these 10 scenes and they take place in these different eras and they have these different themes and involve different costumes or colors or whatever. And then your job is to go out and find the things to actually um, to execute those looks. And so you quite literally dress people for a living. So you're given a budget and you go out and shop and then you dress people for whatever the gig is. And that's what a fashion or celebrity or what they sometimes call a wardrobe stylist is. It differs from being a designer because a designer actually designs and makes clothes Whereas a stylist goes and shops for the clothes that have already been made. They're at a store somewhere. So I would drive around L.A. for hmm. 8 to 12 hours a day and go to every shop and every designer showroom and pick out clothes for every single job. Then bring it somewhere, dress the people, pack it all back up and take it back. So wow. oftentimes what I tell guys when they ask about it, because typically females understand fashion a little more than <laughs> a lot of guys do. I'm like, you ever moved apartments? Yeah. Well, you know, you have to pack all your stuff up and you take it from point A to point B. Yeah. Well, I was basically a mover, but I was a mover of clothes, shoes and accessories. And I moved <laughs> shit around L.A. for <laughs> other cities for 17 years, you know. So that's so that's what it was. And um, and I fell into it just randomly. As I said earlier, I got hired by an old friend of mine who was Aerosmith's uh, stylist. And so she hired me as her an assistant. <laughs> And then I was just like, wow, this is cool because I'm playing in bands and now I get to hang out with all of these musicians and I'm not as cool as them because I'm essentially like their shoe shine boy. But at least I got to be, <laughs> you know, going to concerts and preparing tours and going to rehearsals and, you know, yeah. going to the Grammys and the American Music Awards and watching the bands backstage and, you know, being part of the music industry and the entertainment industry cool. just as a support member more so than being a performer, you know, so kind of being behind camera. But that's also exciting and creative. And eventually I really started to put more effort into it and more attention to it and started to enjoy the creative process and helping to really present a look. So if I'm working with a band for an album cover photo shoot or something, I mean, it's like really neat to be able to participate in that little piece of history and help that artist to become successful. Wow. So that's what that that's what that career kind of was about. And I got to work with hundreds of amazing musicians, you know, like Marilyn Manson and the Foo Fighters and Kanye West and oh, wow. Ozzy Osbourne and wow. Doubt and just all kinds of different uh, people from all different genres of, of music. So it was um, it was really fun. And then, you know, your odd actor or actress or model and a lot of advertising jobs and commercials and things like that. And wow. It can be quite lucrative too. I mean, if you're successful at it, it's it pays really well, and so it's a it's a great kind of freelance artist career. So it it's your you work as a freelancer, so it's much like being a, a makeup artist or a hairstylist. It's within that category. Cool. It's called the vanities department, or the what they call it sometimes the glam squad. So <laughs> you're the team, you're the team kind of behind the scenes that make that makes a celebrity look perfect and marketable and. You know, you help kind of um, broadcast their particular aesthetic during the different courses of their career and sometimes even help them to dramatically change their aesthetic and kind of reinvent themselves and things like that. Huh, that's cool. Wow. Well, we, 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 talking about glam, uh, it makes me think of 
I would imagine, Gareth, we, you know, we're similar ages that we, we watched a lot of MTV when we were like youngsters. Um, and I, and there was obviously a lot of music videos all the time. And, but some of the outfits were like some of the, like you said, the, the glam rock scene was like just incredible. Like, so, so did you get some inspiration from those, those guys sometimes? And is, is, was there anything too far? Like, was there, you know, did some people just say, I don't care what you do, just I want to look like outrageous, like just incredible? Or did they usually give you like a, a mandate of what they wanted exactly? Or Well, it, it depends on the artist, you know, in some cases, um, you know, like I did some work with the Foo Fighters for a while, for example, and those guys are super chill. I mean, they just basically want to wear good jeans and sneakers and a T-shirt and, you know, maybe a cool jacket or something. So an artist like that doesn't want too much interference. They're not trying to have Mr. Fashion come in and put them in a pink suit or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so it, it really just depends on the job. But the client that I had for the longest period of time, which is, I don't know, probably two, three years or something was Marilyn Manson. And that wow. was wow. kind of around the mid to late 2000s. So he wasn't in his prime as he was like in the late or mid to late nineties when he yeah. was like having a lot of hits and was a really big deal, but he still had a massive and still does a massive cult following and tours mm -hmm. and is quite successful doing that. But working with him was probably the most fun because I got to be really wow. creative and we're both the yeah. same age and we're the same size and we understand the same cultural references and things like that. So yeah. he liked working with me because I would never try and do anything that wasn't in alignment with his own taste and aesthetics. And I really yeah. got what he liked quickly. It was easy for me to just intuit things that he would dig and things he wouldn't dig. But it was fun for me because I got to be really creative and I had budgets that were <laughs> you know, that gave me the ability to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. Oftentimes wow. you, you, when you work with a band that's, um, you know, like a newer band or something like that, they want to look really fly, but their label won't give you the budget to do that. And so <laughs> there you are like at top shop or H and M or something trying to make no a really, <laughs> wow. a really great look with, without the budget that, um, is necessary to do that. Cause high fashion is really expensive. So yeah. Yeah, so in terms of how much creative license I had, it really depended on the project in terms of working with musicians. But working with models, like doing what you call an editorial, that's where you're dressing models for a fashion story. That's where you really get creative because it doesn't matter kind of how wild it is. There's usually a, a sort of a story or a narrative, a theme, um, whether it's, say, animal print or um, color blocking or, you know, um, uh, like based on a location, like to shoot out in the desert or at the beach or whatever it is. Yeah. So you have, you have a somewhat specific theme to follow, but within that you still have a lot of creative license. So, I mean, addressing tall, skinny girls is also relatively easy because everything looks great on them. It fits them. <laughs> and that's, that's why those women or men in some cases are models, you know, cause you just throw anything yeah. on them and you're like, Oh my God, they look amazing. <laughs> uh, so I, I got to do a lot of do a lot of creative work on those jobs and then also on music videos and music videos um you really have the ability to kind of do things as a stylist that you wouldn't be able to do on a photo shoot because a photo shoot is more of a um uh, something that's going to be used for a longer period of time and it's more representative of who the artist is whereas in a music mm -hmm. video you're kind of creating this fantasy narrative um according to the treatment or the script of the video and so as long as you mm -hmm. kind of stick to the treatment and you do something that the artist likes, you can get really crazy and play with a lot of costumes and do some really weird stuff because it's just a, it's a video. It's not going to represent that artist forever. It's just forever, yeah. it's about whatever represents that particular song at that point in time. So had a lot of oh, fun cool. working on those yeah. projects over the years. Yeah, yeah. that's so cool. What, what's uh, Marilyn Manson like as a person? And also, what's Ozzy Osbourne like? Oh, man. Well, Ozzy Osbourne, you know, it's funny. I was an assistant when I worked with him and uh, funny. I worked with him on two different occasions. It was it was funny because when I was a kid, like before I discovered the Rolling Stones, who then in my teen years became my all time favorite band and still are like Keith Richards is my all time favorite musician mm -hmm. ever. But my whole childhood, I was obsessed with Ozzy and Black Sabbath. I mean, that was like the number one. I used to write <laughs> Ozzy with marker on my on my knuckles like he had a tattoo <laughs> yeah. of. I mean literally I was obsessed with Ozzy Osbourne so the first time I got to work with him it was crazy because this girl that was his stylist wow. during the time when they had that show the Osbournes it was a reality yeah. show about the family and it was right during that time 
And this girl that I work for named Brooke Doolian, who was the whole family stylist at that time, she's like, hey, can you work today? Are you available? It was like nine in the morning. I was like, yeah, I'm free. What's up? She's like, I need you to go to Ozzy's house and take his measurements because we're doing this project or something. I was like, oh, shit. What? <laughs> wow. And she what? wasn't even going to be there. And I was like, no I'm way. not even sure that I know how to take someone's measurements. But I was like, yeah, I got oh, it. OK, I'm cool. on it. You know? <laughs> this is totally weird. So I. I go to drive to the address in Beverly Hills in my piece of shit car and park out <laughs> in front of this mansion and ring the buzzer. Eh. You know, someone answers on staff. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm here for Ozzy. One moment. Eh. No they buzz me in. I walk in. I'm just like, hey, wow. Ozzy, I'm Luke. You know, just totally surreal, weird. Gee, Not yeah. that I was that starstruck. I mean, I've been living in L.A. for a long time at that point. But yeah. that particular guy was like yeah. such a huge part of my childhood. And uh, so, you know, we we hung out and it was it was one of the most fun experiences of my life, actually. Um, although he was pretty heavily medicated at that period in his life, it was, it was kind of sad because he yeah, was on a yeah. lot of psych meds, and you know anyone that watched that TV show would attest to that fact. So I don't know what exactly was going on there, but he, you know, he wasn't 100% with it, uh, you could say. But he was still really fun and funny and cool. And uh, at the end of our measurements and the fitting, he invited me into his like den, his man cave, to wow. listen to his new album. What? He's like, hey, you want to hear my new album? I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't released yet, so I went in his his den Ooh. with I think, a girl. It was just me and this other girl who was a makeup artist or something, and he proceeds to turn up this goddamn stereo to an ear-bleeding, <laughs> like, inhumane volume and played this entire album. We were in there for, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes. He plays the whole album. Oh, and my God. It was so loud that it was like uh, oh my, God. my ears bleed. But no I'm sitting way. there going, dude, you're you're in Ozzy's den listening to his new unreleased album. Yeah. <laughs> He's giving you a play by play report of what every song's about. Like this is not the moment where you ask him to turn it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just you know, I I withstood the volume and uh, and it was a really interesting album too. It was all based on the character Rasputin. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, just totally bizarre, like really random. And it never came out. The album never actually oh, was wow. released. So I don't know what happened to it, but I've heard the unreleased Ozzy album, you know, That's awesome. in its entirety. So that was a really, a really fun moment. And then went on to work with him uh, one other time, you know. So those are those times that I'll always cherish and just remember as just something totally bizarre. If you would have gone back to me as a drug addicted 10 year old kid and been like, hey, you're listening to Black Sabbath. Um, in how you know 16 years you're going to be hanging out at ozzy's house listening to his new album it's just totally weird like how does that yeah. even happen you know? yes it's so incredible that, yeah that was a really yeah. neat, a really neat if experience. it's too loud you're too old and so <laughs> yeah exactly really, yeah. <laughs> but it really was too loud and that happened <laughs> years later when i first started working with marilyn manson same thing i had a fitting at their studio and went over while they were recording same thing. Hey, want to hear the new track? I'm like, yeah, great. And then they turned. It was so loud. And I'm like, oh my god. You know, I'm sitting there going, you pussy, Luke. Don't say anything. And I'm like, oh yeah. god, but my ears are so bad. You know? Oh, that's yeah. so funny. If that well, had happened to me today, I would probably be like, oh, I'm really enjoying this, but I got to be honest. Would you mind turning it down a little bit? I was just like, yeah. I was more of a people pleaser at that time in my life. <laughs> Well, you've got a, like you said, a textured uh, journey and, and I love it because it's just so, so interesting and you've met such interesting people. Hey, this is like super cool. But you, you, what sort of started you really onto your your biohacking sort of health journey? W was it just a natural progression? You were just feeling tired or you did you have like health issues that you were trying to like address uh, or had you always had sort of an interest in the health side of things and I'd love to hear about some of the sort of things that you tried, like the Cambo medicine and, and different things and, and see uh, how that journey is evolving for you uh, currently as well. Sure. Well, you know, I realized back in the 90s when I first got sober that I was really, really sick and malnourished. Just for reference, I'm six foot two and right now... I mean, I could probably stand to lose five pounds, I'd say, around the midsection, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> my ideal weights, if I was, if I had some a bit more muscle on, I'm like 180, right? Yeah. Mm. I wish a little more of that was muscle than fat, is what I'm saying. So maybe <laughs> 180, 185, 62 is a pretty healthy weight. I'm kind of a tall, skinny, ectomorph type guy. Mm. Uh, when I was 26, when I got sober, I was also 62, obviously, and uh, I weighed 135 pounds. So oh, wow. Picture. Yeah, I didn't do a lot of eating um, uh, during those 
period, that period of my life. So I was very malnourished and very sick. I was, I always had the flu. I always had a cold. I always had constipation, diarrhea, acne, uh, completely depressed, full of anxiety, totally ADD, just out of my mind, couldn't be present. I suffered from just crazy outbursts of anger and um, sudden waves of just desperate sadness and just was an emotional and physical basket case. And so I set out when I was first sober to start doing all of this detoxing to get all of those drugs and all the toxins out of my system. And that was kind of the beginning of my journey where I got into herbalism and saunas and colonics and things like that. And then over the years, um, was exposed to different technologies and what we now call biohacking, which is just using different various health devices and energy devices and, and all of this kind of stuff. As you see behind me here, there's a, there's a, a clear light infrared sauna and I've had one of those for like 18 years or something, you know? Awesome. So that's how I first got into it was just realizing like, man, wow, my body's really not well. And, and I, I needed to get fit and started doing various forms of yoga and finally going to the gym and doing some running and things like that. And uh, that's how I kind of got into the health stuff. And then it's always been a matter really of kind of balancing out the, the metaphysical and emotional approach, you know, the um, different forms of therapy and different spiritual practices and things like that with the physical stuff. Because in order to be emotionally energetic and to provide value in the world, I find that my meat suit, the physical body has to be tuned up and has to be well rested and nourished and can't be ingesting toxins of any kind and have to live a pretty physically clean lifestyle mm -hmm. in order to have the physical body able to carry the energy that I want to produce in the world out there. And so, yeah. I mean, it's definitely don't have enough time to talk about all the crazy shit that I've yeah. explored. I mean, stem cell treatment was one of them. You mentioned the Cambo frog, which is a, you know, Amazonian medicine that unfortunately is not psychoactive. It just makes you really sick, but it um, is said to really enhance your immune system because you, you, a shaman burns you on the arm or back of the neck mm -hmm. or wherever, and then rubs this frog poison, this venom in you, it gets in your lymphatic system. You have this huge purge and then, for about two weeks after, you feel very clear. Um, so that was one oh. of the experiments I did. Probably something I would only do once. Many mm -hmm. people go back for multiple uh, sessions, but once was good for me. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm really into the stuff that's kind of in alignment with nature. So I think to, to summarize, like my favorite biohacks, there's there's the infrared sauna, and then there's getting sun exposure on my whole body as much as possible, mm -hmm. doing the ice baths, doing cryotherapy, uh, avoiding blue light and artificial light after dark, like the plague. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally, I'm either wearing some kind of blue blocking glasses or having orange or red light in my house. All of my devices are all hacked, so they turn red at night. I don't have any blue light. Wow. Uh, you know, last night I went out to a party and whatever. I, I forgot my yeah. blue blockers, and so at 10 o'clock, <laughs> I'm still looking at street lights and stuff. But most nights when it gets dark outside, I'm mindful of that, and I've habituated myself so that it gets dark inside. Um, I have a cool. bulletproof vibe plate. I have a red light therapy device here across from me called a Juve, uh, which is really good for mitochondria um, health and also just um, recovery from workouts and injuries. And it's really good for your skin. I have a machine called an amp coil that is a combination of biofeedback and PEMF therapy. And that's used for cleansing mm -hmm. and nourishing organs as well as uh, consciousness. And uh, I have something called a Nano V, which is um, really great for oxidative stress, and um, it's a really potent antioxidant. And I have another device called a uh, Vital Reaction Molecular Hydrogen Inhaler that I use every day, mm -hmm. and that is really profoundly powerful antioxidant uh, treatment. So I have a lot of kind of medical devices that are for biohacking, and I travel mm -hmm. with many of them. And I'm always working on different um, types of EMF mitigation. That's a huge issue that we're now facing, especially with 5G about to roll out. So um, the biohacking is something I'm passionate about, and it's a hobby. Mm. But the purpose of getting the, the physical body fine-tuned is just to execute my spiritual mission with more effectiveness, to be able to have the energy that I can go share in the world. Um, it's wow. easy to get caught up with all the physical stuff and sort of stop there and not do the real work, which is, you know, mm. doing something like quitting sex for a year yeah. and yeah. really, you know, looking at my relationships and my childhood trauma and relationships with my parents and family of origin and all of those things. So I think for me, the 
why I call my show the lifestylist and everything I do is to really approach the whole human experience from a healing point of view and uh, know that it all has to be included within that healing. You can't ignore any part of it. Otherwise, the other bits mm. don't work. You know, it's a synergistic approach. For sure. And, and one of the things that I actually wanted to find out a bit more about was EMF. What, what is it exactly? Yeah. Um, and what, what are the issues around it? Sure. Well, there's a couple different types of EMF. It stands for electromagnetic fields, right? And so as I sit in my office here, there are a few different fields going on. Uh, one would be uh, my cell phone is sitting here and my cell phone is receiving radiation. There's radiation in the air coming from cell towers to the phone. The phone's putting out radiation. The cell towers are sending in radiation. That radiation goes through your body just like it goes through walls. And that's called a radio frequency. Mm -hmm. Then you have electric frequencies, which is all the wiring in my house. So mm -hmm. the wiring on my computer, this thing is producing an electrical field that generates about three to six mm -hmm. feet from whatever device and from all the walls. Wow. So inside all the walls of this room, in my ceiling, because there's ceiling lighting, in my floor, right underneath my chair, there's an apartment underneath me that has lighting in its ceiling, which is mm -hmm. radiating up on me and my dog right now with an electrical field. And then you have the third one, which is a magnetic field. And magnetic fields are typically generated by transformers on power lines, refrigerators, heavy machinery, anything with a motor typically produces a magnetic field. And all of those fields are deleterious to human health. They all interfere with our biological processes. And there is a lot of research uh, which indicates now that they are also the root of many degenerative diseases such as cancer, et cetera. That said, we live in a modern world with modern technology, and I love the technology. I love Skype that we're on. I love this microphone, my phone, <laughs> Wi-Fi, all of that. So it's not something you can really escape from. You can, you can diminish the effects of it by moving out into the middle of the mountain somewhere, but even there, uh, there are still cell towers now everywhere. I mean, there's very few places mm. on Earth where you can't get a signal, and there's electricity everywhere. So it's mostly inescapable. So without being paranoid or running around in a tinfoil hat, what I do is I study more and more about the effects of it so that I'm motivated to mitigate some of my exposure. And there's a number of different things you can do. I would say for people listening, if this is something you want to research and look into, because I think it's the number one health risk that we face. I mean, probably more important than diet is the artificial blue wow. light at night and EMF exposure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's worse than eating McDonald's, but it's probably on yeah, par. Yeah. Uh, but what you can do is you can hire an EMF mitigation specialist to come and assess your home or apartment. And what they're going to find is your shit is really not good. <laughs> yeah, <wow. laughs> it's guaranteed uh, because that's just the way that these devices have been designed is for convenience and uh, not for our health, right? And so... What they're going to find is that your whole house is just completely on fire EMF-wise and that you're being wow. radiated constantly. So what I recommend and what any good EMF specialist is going to recommend is that you shield your bedroom at least so that you create a healing sanctuary out of your bedroom. Cool. And essentially what you can do, there's two different choices you have. One is you can have your whole bedroom shielded, uh, which means you're going to paint the whole room with EMF blocking paint, put up EMF blocking curtains, and you essentially turn your room into a Faraday cage, which means mm. no signals get in, no signals get out. And it's a really, really potent healing sanctuary. So you can kind of take yourself back to 1850 living out in the woods. You can create that in a high rise in the middle of a city by mm. blocking all four walls from any penetration from all of these fields mm. that I described. Wow. If wow. you don't want to block the whole room, which, you know, can, depending on the size of the room can cost you three to $5,000, you can also build a Faraday cage around your bed, which mm -hmm. will require a little more creativity. There's not a lot of them on the market that are kind of one and done. You have to really build a frame or have a bed with a frame, and you put this special blocking fabric over the entire bed. You put this uh, EMF blocking mesh underneath the mattress, and you create a safe, impenetrable field around your bed where literally your cell phone won't work inside there. Huh. That's how oh. dead the space becomes and how much it blocks. So. Uh, I'm in the process of making a decision about which way I want to go with that. I have not done that to my room because I'm most likely going to be moving at some point this year into a new place just because I'm ready for to get out of the city and move out and you know a little bit mm -hmm. out of the middle of this 
mess. A lot of it because there's so much EMF around here. It's just yeah. it creates a lot of oxidative stress. It's just really hard on your nervous system, basically. And I've been living here for 30 years, and I can feel it just wearing me down. Yeah. But uh, that's what I would I would recommend. Um, there's also um, some devices that I recently found. There are a lot of devices that claim to help with some of the deleterious effects of EMF. Most of the ones that I found on the market have no real proof and they're kind of woo woo. Like, oh, this protects you from EMFs. It's a little crystal pyramid mm. or something. And it's like, eh, <laughs> it's not, you know, it might work, but you don't really know. Um, but I recently found a company called Blue Shield, one word Blue Shield. And Blue Shield makes these devices that are called scalar devices. I actually have some coming in the mail. Hopefully they arrive today. And you can put one of these devices in your car. You can carry a small one on your person. They have all different sizes. Um, you can put one in your home, and they're you know between three and three hundred and a thousand dollars, depending on how big of one you get and how much surface you're trying to cover. Mm. But what they do is they sort of scramble the signals so that you're still in an EMF field, but it doesn't affect your biology. It balances you out on an energetic level so that you become essentially impervious to all of these fields. And that's another really powerful way that you can mitigate that. And based on all the things that I've heard of and all the research I've done, that's the only device that has quantitative, verifiable studies that show its effects. And uh, there's a number of different ways that they do that using like animal studies on farms and all sorts of weird stuff because there's they, they use animal studies so there's no placebo, you know? Because you can mm -hmm. put one in the house, but do you feel better? And I go, yeah, I feel great since this thing is there, you know? <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, they've done these studies and uh, the guy's from New Zealand, actually, uh, the inventor has been working on this for 30 years and uh, they do studies in chicken coops and on cow farms and stuff where the animals, you know, get all these blood tests and things with the device and without the device and they're right next to a cell tower wow. and all this crazy shit and they really work. They work on animals mm. and we're animals. So, so those are things you can do. Build a Faraday cage around your bed, at least so when you sleep, your body can do what it's meant to do to restore itself. If the Faraday cage around your bed is too weird and inconvenient, just shield your bedroom. It's like all the biohacking, all the vitamins, all the supplements, all that shit, save your money, stop buying all that, and just shield your bedroom so at least when you sleep, your body <laughs> can do what it's supposed to do, which is cellular repair and detox. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm gonna, yes. I have to follow my own advice, you know, because after 21 years of research into all this stuff, I'm telling you, the worst thing for our health right now is EMFs by far. Wow. Is, it's undeniable. Yeah, it's everywhere, isn't it? It's crazy. It is, yeah. and it's getting worse. You know, the 5G is just insane. There, there's no, there's no testing or any studies as to its safety at all. And there's Jeez. so many studies uh, that prove that it's really, really dangerous and also just unnecessary. I mean, my cell phone works just fine. I'm good. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah, it's exactly. Like, yeah. I don't need a stronger signal. It's fine. It's very rare that I'm like, what? I can't hear you. It's breaking up. You know, like, yeah, yeah. no, they're fine. So it's, it's scary. Yeah. But on the yeah. other side of that, listen, we're all going to die. I'm going to die at some point in, you know, the not too distant future as we all are, we're going to leave our physical body. So it's not about being paranoid and negative and, you know, that energy yeah, of sure. fear is also very toxic too, to us psychically totally. and emotionally. So it's not about yeah. being afraid and being paranoid, putting on the tinfoil hat. It's about being <laughs> honest about the real threat yeah. of our modern lifestyle and in a sober, sound, sane way, taking some steps and putting a little energy toward mitigating those things. And, yeah, you know, yeah. you're still going to die, sure. but maybe a less painful death, yeah. you know, than you would For have sure. if you're sleeping you know, next to your Wi-Fi router every night and you don't know that you're giving yourself fucking brain cancer because you're yeah. radiation through your skull for eight hours a night. You know, a lot Jesus. of people just don't know about these things or they sleep with their cell phone under their pillow. I mean, it's like yeah. it's how yeah. much uh, lack Crap. of awareness have you know so there's there's little things you can do to protect yourself that make a huge difference over the course of you know a span of an 80 year lifetime living yeah within sure this kind of ex human experiment that we live in now in terms of the technology yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. totally I, I i remember watching this uh, documentary recently and there were people that like suffered from emf like severely and they literally had to like live out in mountains and things like that. And they, you know, and it would still affect them like out there. So it like, it, it is a definitely yeah. a thing that, that some people mm. suffer a lot from of the, the, the company that I was talking about out of New Zealand, Blue Shield. Um, and I wish I had their web, website handy. You can put it in your show notes though. You'll yeah. know when you find it. just type Blue Shield EMF protection and you'll find it. But, uh, a lot of their anecdotal um, testimonials are from people that are highly electrosensitive. Hmm. 
that have had to go live in their car, go live out in a field, like literally move out of their house because they're so sick and they put one of these devices in their house, they move back in and live happily ever after. It's crazy. Wow. It's really, think, really cool. Yeah, I'm very I, hopeful. I, about I like what you're saying though about almost finding a bit of a, a hierarchy of needs. Like I think so many people without being fearful of things, you've got to find what are the things that you can give you the best sort of bang for your back, you know? And I think it's cool that you, you've done that research with people. So you can say, look, the EMF is a big thing. Actually yeah. worry about that. Cause you know, there's so many little things, maybe you shouldn't eat X, Y, and Z or this or that, but that's one of those things that actually is almost like sort of quantifiable, maybe do something about it. Um, so that's a big one. Are there any others that are like really big ones that you would say like, definitely take like sugar for example or is there something specific I mean, there's, that you, you really know, there's focus the, on there's the main offenders which is processed food and processed water uh mm. food would mean most food that comes in a package is not good for you <laughs> you know even if it's labeled health food so i'm an advocate for avoiding grains uh of all types not just gluten um not that i do that perfectly but that's my objective also something that's that's really really prevalent in our food supply is um, our seed oils, what they call vegetable oils, quote unquote, mm. uh, canola oil, <laughs> seed oils are really, really inflammatory and really bad for you. Uh, all artificial sweeteners, all MSG and hidden forms of MSG, those things right there, corn syrup, another one, and just, you know, even just highly yeah. refined white sugar. If you could just avoid those, you're kind of halfway there, whether you eat animal products or not, like, Mm. To me, just getting the huge, the elephant in the room toxins out of the way. And then by processed yeah. water, I mean water that is poorly filtered municipal tap water. That's generally very toxic. It's really hard to filter out the thousands of toxins in tap water. So I really avoid tap water like the plague. I prefer to drink whenever possible spring water and glass. So I'm mm. a huge advocate of water. I just did a six and a half hour podcast trilogy all about drinking water. Uh, for those wow, listening wow. that want want my whole spiel on water, you can um, you can go to lukestory.com forward slash one two nine and download my whole like four page PDF on all things filters, drinking water, what the best options wow. are there. Cool. Again, that's uh, Luke Story S T O R E Y forward slash one two nine. It's like so long to explain to people. I found it was just like yeah. I'm just making a, a <laughs> mini ebook and I just give it away for free because it's just it's such an important thing. But we're made of water mostly, you know. Your cells yeah. are 97 percent water. When you die, if you get cremated, you're left with about you know eight ounces of dust, and the rest of you was water that's just evaporated, you know. So um, you want to build your body and your cells out of really high quality water, ideally, if you're in a position to do so. So sure. I think those are those are a couple other really strong recommendations for me. Thanks. Yeah, that's yeah. that's very cool. And and sorry, Luke. I mean, we just we're conscious of time here now. Um, and you know, we could talk to you for ages, and we've literally scratched yeah. <laughs> the surface on things. Um, but uh, you know, before we say thank you um, for your time and and for this podcast, uh, what is the best way for people to you know to get a hold of you, to follow you? Where can they find out about you? Sure. I think the thing that I'm most excited about in terms of the content I'm producing in the world would be my podcast, which I've mentioned is called The Life Stylist, three words, The Life Stylist. And there I interview top experts in the fields of uh, spirituality, meditation, yoga, biohacking, health, sexuality, relationships, uh, fitness, any type of personal improvement or personal development on the physical or metaphysical level. So that's kind of my flagship. And then my main site is lukestory.com where I have all of my videos and all of the show notes for every podcast and all of that. And then in terms of social media, I would say I'm most active on Instagram and my Instagram is at lukestory, S-T-O-R-E-Y. And uh, there you'll find me doing a lot of really wacky, hopefully educational and funny things, especially on my stories and Instagram live, uh, my feed, I kind of keep pretty, you know, uh, because the feed is there forever, but the stories I can really kind of <laughs> get crazy yeah. and I have a, I have a lot of fun with the stories and stuff. So, um, I would recommend people follow me on Instagram and that'll also kind of be a gateway into all of my shows and things like that, that I do. Yeah. Awesome. That's so cool, man. Well, well, thank you so much for, for sharing those. And, um, first of all, thanks so, so much for coming on our podcast. It's, uh, oh, thanks it's really for having me. an absolute, like, pleasure and privilege having you on our podcast so 
it was just so nice like you know we started following you on instagram and stuff and we were just like oh this guy's really cool let's ask him and like straight away you replied i was like what no way so that's really really <laughs> cool we really for appreciate sure it. man um, no absolutely i i love supporting other podcasters i was very fortunate when i started my show I was able to get a lot of really big people in the health industry and spiritual teachers and stuff like that. I was actually kind of shocked at how many people said yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, and some of the bigger people that said yes really helped me to get other guests and helped me to build my platform. So yeah. I always feel yeah. like not like I'm even as famous as the people that were on my show. But, you know, you were excited about talking to me. I'm like, yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's so a way to, this. you know, to pay it to pay it forward because yeah, it's, it's awesome. um, I'm so grateful that people have agreed to do my show. I, I don't get very many no's, which is nice, you know, so I don't tend to yeah. say no much either. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's man. so cool of you, man. And there, there was like there were so many guys that like have been on your podcast, like Aubrey Marcus and Light Watkins and JP Sears. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I want to ask you about them because yeah. they're <laughs> such amazing people. Um, yeah. And and yeah, so so it's been so interesting talking to you. You know what I mean? And like you've lived such a like you said a, a textured life and and a colorful life, and you know you actually just briefly touched on some of those things. You know, and and I, I'll we'll put it in all the show notes, but people should go and listen to you know a lot of those things that did actually happen. You know, like um, in a bit more detail because it's, it's very very interesting. You know, for for people to to know where you you properly came from. Um, but we we totally like just I was just I was just super interested in, in the cool things about music and like the guys you had met and like fashion and why it's important. And but but what you're doing now is is super important for uh, humanity um, and for for people. Um, and it, it's really, really interesting. So thank you for for like experimenting and, and being like a sort of. A dummy you know like yourself you know and, and putting your body out <laughs> there sure. um sure. and uh, yeah man like just wanted to uh wish you all the best for everything that goes on hopefully one day if we're ever in town we'll 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 be, get to meet you in person and that'll just be really really cool um absolutely. so appreciate yeah, you absolutely. appreciate all your time thanks you too guys i appreciate it man thanks for having me on and, and just real briefly i mean i can't add too much there's uh you know we we just uh, like you said, we could just scratch the surface. Like we didn't get into the sick care model. There's so many interesting things that you are like exploring. And um, so, you know, we are super grateful for your time because I think this is the stuff you're doing is really important. And you're just asking the right questions and it gets people engaging in another way of thinking. And I think that's what it's really all about. So it's just getting people thinking about themselves and getting out of this the sort of bubble that we're in of external and then let's go from within again, you know, let's look from the inside mm -hmm. out. And I think that's the, the feeling I get from when I'm listening to you and, and talking to you about all your adventures is that that's where it all begins. And, and that's really a cool message for people just to, to take it with from within again. And so, so thank you so much for, for that message. And yep. we're really stoked to have chatted to you and we wish you all the best with uh, your podcast. Obviously it's doing super well already, but it's uh you know it's just great so so thanks for your time and have an awesome week cheers thanks fella i appreciate it cool my man cool. top man all right